Boom Boss, we talk to a lot of different economists. We try to cast a wide net to give you a better feel for the diversity of views out there. We're talking about people like George Selgin, Larry White, Alex Tabarrok, Ann Pettifor, Steve Keen, Tim Dewey, Steve Hankey, and David Beckworth. That's the tip of the iceberg for the variety of opinion that you're going to hear on Boom Bust. Now, different economists say very different things and give very different advice about the exact same situations. It can be confusing. So we thought it might be useful to build a roadmap by dividing the economics profession into four basic groups of thought and then explaining each group. As it turns out, the main dividing line for the schools of thoughts uh, revolves around government. Some economists think policymakers should intervene and boost the economy. Others do not. What we want to do here is to tell you which economists say not to intervene and which say to intervene and when. Now, here's how we're going to divvy it up for you. We've got four groups of thought divided by whether they think fiscal or monetary stimulus is warranted when the economy is flagging. Now, first are the monetarists here in the upper left corner, exemplified by Steve Hankey. Now, they argue that government should intervene only to the degree it stabilizes credit or nominal GDP growth over the long term. They don't want any fiscal stimulus. Now, the Austrians here in the bottom left, they think, like George Selgin and Larry White, they want to limit intervention entirely, whether on the fiscal or the monetary side. They believe the economy is better left to market forces. Now, over here on the bottom right, we have the post-Keynesians exemplified by Ann Pettifor and Steve Keen. They argue that fiscal policy is a buffer against business cycles created by changes in private debt accumulation. And as such, fiscal policy is the right way to deal with a sharp break in the economy. And finally, there are the new Keynesians up here on the upper right side. They argue for both fiscal and monetary stimulus to revive the economy. And today, we're going to talk about the new Keynesians because they have dominated policy in recent years. New Keynesianism is not the, the work of the legendary economist John Maynard Keynes. Rather, it's a hybrid of what Keynes espoused during the Great Depression and what his rivals, the so-called neoclassical economists, espoused. Now, in the 1950s, American economist Paul Samuelson tried to combine neoclassical economics and the economics of Keynes into what is commonly known as the neoclassical synthesis. And today, the neoclassical synthesis is what we call mainstream economics. New Keynesian economics is the dominant macro school that, in macroeconomics within mainstream economics. The best way to describe Keynesianism, or New Keynesianism that is, is as the school of thought that most tries to combine the competing economic schools of the Great Depression, neoclassical economics, and Keynesian economics. That's what economic, uh, economists call the micro foundations for Keynesian economics. And what that basically means is a world in which the average person is assumed to be rational and market forces are usually the best way to get supply and demand to balance. But here's the thing. New Keynesians believe there are market failures where government has to intervene. A lot of this has to do with the fact that wages and prices don't really move up and down the way textbooks say they should. Wages and prices are sticky, meaning business people hate to cut wages or change prices unless they absolutely have to. And even then, wages and prices don't fully adjust to bring supply and demand into equilibrium. New Keynesians say this and other factors bring about market failure. Now, the financial crisis of 2008 is a perfect example of such a failure, and they recommend government intervene to stop that failure from becoming acute. It could be the federal government increasing spending or lowering taxes. It could be the Federal Reserve lowering interest rates or buying government bonds or mortgage bonds. The New Keynesians support stimulus, whether it's monetary or fiscal. So the response to the great financial crisis was basically a new Keynesian response. The thinking was that the global economy and the financial system were basically sound, but there was a big market failure, and that this market failure led to a crisis. The right response under this thinking was intervention, both by the central banks and by the federal governments of the world. And of course, that's exactly what we got. But 78 years after the crisis, there's still something terribly wrong in the global economy. Some economists say that's what's, what's wrong is how we went about trying to fix things. And later this week, 
will present the view of those economists as we break down the field of economics for you. Yesterday in the big deal, we tried to break down the field of economics for you. Different economists obviously give very different advice about the exact same situations, and frankly, that can be confusing. So we built a roadmap by dividing the econ world into four major groups. Yesterday, we covered New Keynesianism. That's because it's the dominant school in macroeconomics. New Keynesians most influence the response to the financial crisis. But seven to eight years after the crisis, there is still something wrong in the global economy. So now we want to present the view of economists who offer a different economic framework. Let's start in the upper left-hand corner with monetarists. Now, after World War II, New Keynesians dominated policy, but when stagflation broke out in the developed economies in the 1970s, monetarism rose in stature. The father of monetarism is American economist Milton Friedman. He's famous for his quip that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And by that, he meant that he believes central banks make inflation and that they can stop it, too. It's under that thinking that U.S. Fed Chair Paul Volcker hiked interest rates to a peak of 20% in June 1981. Inflation came down sharply in the years that followed Volcker's rate hikes. And so despite the dominance of new Keynesians on macro policy, policymakers have come to rely on central banks more and more. When the financial crisis hit, it created doubts about the role of central banks. Market monetarists like David Beckworth, Scott Sumner, and Lars Christensen have responded by saying central banks should be less active and just focus on a stable, long-term path of nominal growth. Growth. They say this would work better than an inflation and unemployment target and get the economy back to the pre-crisis trend. Other economic schools actually disagree, though. For example, the Austrian School of Economics believes in letting market forces play out as much as possible. When I talked to George Selgin, he even advocated free banking. That's where government doesn't have a monopoly on legal tender. For Austrians, market forces mean not just reining in government spending, but also reining in central banks. The best-known Austrian economist is Ludwig von Mises. In the early 20th century, he warned that he believed often crisis and depression resulted from misallocated investment during booms, which he said were caused by artificial conditions from low interest rates. What seemed profitable during a bubble suddenly became very unprofitable. Adherents of this school, like Peter Schiff, for example, say they, that they predicted the financial crisis. Schiff said in real time that the housing bubble was a textbook case of artificial profitability driven by low rates, destined, of course, to end badly. And of course, it did end badly. Now, the Austrians, they see the continued interference of central banks today and governments as setting up an even worse situation down the line. Now, the post-Keynesians also have a claim on predicting the latest crises, too, uh, using a very different framing and solutions. Frequent boom-bust guest Ann Pettifor, for example, she wrote a book in 2006 called The Coming of the First World Debt Crisis. She claimed large private debts could hurt millions of ordinary borrowers and cause a big financial crisis. Now, when the crisis actually began to pass, her book became a bestseller. Also, the late British economist Wynne Godley, he predicted the euro crisis in 1992, this is a long time ago now, using the post-Keynesian framework. He said that giving up monetary sovereignty would make the crisis worse in depressed euro economies, and of course it has. The post-Keynesian view, similar to the Austrian view in that uh, people like Pettifor and Steve Keen blame the Fed, politicians, and mainstream economists. The post-Keynesians see them pushing excessive borrowing and consumption to prop up the economy. The solution, they say, is not to intervene with monetary policy like the monetarists or new, or new Keynesians suggest. It's also not to stand by and let market forces work through things, just as famous 20th century economist uh, Irving Fisher said. He said that the Great Depression was caused by debt deflation taking hold. If the government lets large private debts get liquidated without a response, that's what's going to happen. They see a need for government to support demand while the economy adjusts to more sustainable levels of private debt. They say the government, as a monopoly supplier of money, has the wherewithal to keep the economy from collapsing that private sector agents do not. 
So, okay, that's our quick breakdown of the field of economics today. Some very different solutions from very different frameworks. That's all for now. We also love hearing from you. So tweet at us, at Edward and H, at Bianca Faschini, and at Amira David. And remember, you can see all the segments featured in today's show on YouTube at youtube.com slash boombustrt. From all of us here at Boombust, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.